Although the evidence against the 13 defendants was overwhelming, all but one went free. As I mentioned, Marvin Massey, a footloose 16-year-old, was convicted for his mock auction and burning of the bishop's books. He was sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor, but at the request of 5,000 citizens, including Bishop Fenwick, whose name headed the list, and the Mother Superior, Massey was pardoned. The triumphant buzzle was doubtless let, less delighted by an unexpected outcome to the burning. It bolstered the Catholic cause as few other events could have. One unidentified Protestant writer who remained staunchly anti-Catholic deplored the burning for its obvious cowardliness, but more because it rallied popular sympathy where none should have been afforded. The propaganda of Rome, he fumed in 1835, and the founders of the Leopold Fund in Austria to convert heretics in America could not have found better missionaries for their purpose than the scoundrels who brought the convent. No compensation was ever given for the destruction of Ursuline Convent. The convent ruins stood for nearly half a century, grim evidence that Reformation fires of intolerance still smoldered more than 200 years after they were brought to America. The hill upon which the Ursuline Convent stood is now part of Somerville. By the turn of the century, Mount Benedict had been leveled. Its soil was used for landfill. Nothing remains of the convent except some bricks which form the arch of the front vestibule of the present Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston. Attorney General Austin was prescient, prescient enough to see this bleak irony taking shape, and in his closing statements at Buzzle's trial, he asked the jury, Where will be the pride of your American feelings when you take the stranger to Bunker's Heights and show him the slowly rising monument? Where will be the pride of your American feelings when that stranger points to the other monument of ruins that frowns so gloomily on the adjacent eminence? The chills of 50 winters would not send such an ice bolt through your hearts. And finally, the ciborium from Mount Benedict that was thrown away that night by Henry Creasy was eventually recovered. Creasy, one of uh, Buzzle's boys, would later commit suicide. And again, I recommend this book, Fire and Roses, by Nancy Lusignan Schultz. Any questions before I move to Broad Street? So now we move on to the Broad Street Riot. And I, I extracted this from Peter F. Stevens, The Hidden History of the Boston Irish. Once again, thank you to the Watertown Free Public Library for supplying me with all my resources. As usual, the, the Minuteman Library Network is excellent. Um, this is a depiction, you're going to see this in the background, but uh, if you look at Great Financial Crisis, uh, I do another uh, talk called uh, Panics, Booms, Bust, Bubbles, Recessions and Depressions, A History of uh, American Financial Crises. Uh, from the Mississippi uh, Land Bubble of 1720, Dewar's Last Panic, 1792, the, uh, the Depression of 1807, the Depression of 1818, the Depression of 1825, the Depression of 1837, the Depression of 1848, the Depression of 1857, the Depression of 1869, and Grant's Last Panic of 1884. You get the picture. Depressions come every 10, 15 years. We've been through this before. I call this period that we're in the Great Humbling. Um, and um, some last longer. You have to have the nadir, you have to have the, the low point, the trough before you zoom out of it. But in 1837, there was a depression in the United States. And this is the Broad Street Riot. It was a warm and sultry June afternoon when Fire Engine Company 20 had returned to its station on East Street in Boston after having called a blaze in Roxbury. Some of the firemen went to a nearby saloon on their way back to their homes. They waded into about a hundred Irishmen who were on their way to join a funeral procession that was around the corner on C Street. The Boston firefighters, protagonists in this brawl, were native Yankee stock from the poorer streets of Boston where hostility towards Catholics and the Irish was at its fiercest. It was less than three years since the burning of the convent in Charlestown, and also employment was scarce due to the Great Depression of 1837. Tensions ran high. Also, several of the firemen moving towards the crowd of Irishmen allegedly had their hand in the Ursuline Convent fire. They exchanged surly stares, and it seemed peaceable enough as it looked as though the firefighters would pass through the crowd without incident. One 
engine man, 19-year-old George Fay, had lingered longer than his comrades over his cups. He had had a lot of the creature in him, liquid courage. This is a depiction of immigrants, by the way. So Fay, with a cigar dangling from his lips, he shoved several of the Irishmen and insulted them. Fay then flailed away at the Irish in his vicinity, throwing punches. His comrades jumped in to help him out, but they were badly outnumbered and two were severely beaten. The engine men then fled to their station at the order of third foreman W.W. W. Miller. Here's the culprit, this guy. If Miller had simply barred the door, the pursuing Irish probably, and I, I want to stress, probably would have turned back to their funeral procession if he had just locked the door. But Miller, quote, lost his head completely, carried away either with fear or with rage and a thirst for revenge. He issued an emergency alarm so that every fire company in Boston would respond to E Street to take vengeance on the Irish. He rings the fire alarm. All around alarm, he's asking for help. And now all these firefighters are coming in thinking there's a major fire. The Irish began to disperse, but that did not prevent the men of Engine Company 20 from rolling its wagon onto Broad Street and sounding a false alarm. Then Miller dispatched some men to ring the bell at the New South Church and a church on Purchase Street. One of the firefighters dashed to the engine company aid on Common Street yelling, the Irish have risen up upon us and they're gonna kill us. The Irishmen who had fought with Company 20 were now trailing the funeral procession, a hearse and several carriages trailed by about 500 mourners. The cortege wound its way south onto C Street, winding towards the Bunker Hill Cemetery in Charlestown. It's not ironic that it's right near the convent in our section. <laughs> Engine Company 20 had Miller leading them in pursuit of the Irish, and he shouted, let the patties go ahead, and then we'll start. The firemen rushed towards C Street, yelling, now look out, now look for it. The mourners moved only another block when engine company 14 fell upon them, and with one fireman, he was heard to cry out, down with them. The procession then turned onto New Broad Street, that's a funeral procession, near today's South Station, and directly into oncoming engine company number nine. So they're surrounded by engine company nine, 14, and 20 at this point. The horse-drawn fire wagon then veered into the mortar's ranks, scattering and knocking down men, women, and children. The Irish jumped at the conclusion that the number nine's men had intentionally insulted and assaulted them. A melee then erupted, with Miller, Fay, and the rest of Company 20 arriving to join the fracas. Fists and kicks flew in all directions, and screams of rage and pain peeled along Broad Street. By the way, this background you're going to be seeing, that's the only known lithograph or depiction of the Broad Street riot that was drawn up two days after the event. And it shows the militia firing on the crowd, and we'll get to that in just a moment. As I mentioned, fists and kicks flew in all directions, and screams of rage and pain peeled along Broad Street. Sticks, cudgels, and knives soon materialized, and stones, bricks, and other missiles that came to hand slammed against heads and hearse alike. The engine men and the Irishmen would give starkly different accounts of who started the brawl. The Yankees' version was that number nine's engine did not hurt anyone and that the collision was accidental. As one historian points out, the Yankee version did not escape charges of whitewashing. The Irish following the hearse, as well as other witnesses, claimed that George Fay, quote, the very head and leader of the quarrel, seized the rope and guided the engine in among the marchers, while some of the firemen tried to kick Irishmen, and some cried, down with them, trip up the hearse's horse. Then the brawl swelled into a full-scale riot. The hearse's driver inched their way up Broad Street and eventually reached Charlestown, but the procession was quite broken up. 